Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janine Wendt, the Executive Director of HECMA, which is the Higher Education Consortium of Central Massachusetts. We are very pleased to have our honored guest with us today, Professor Daniel Allen from Harvard University. And I'm also really pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the League of Women Voters of Worcester. So I'm gonna turn your attention over to Brenda Safford, who serves as the president of the League of Women Voters of Worcester. Thank you, Janine. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm very honored to be at this event today. And uh, if you could just listen to a message that I just wanted to share with you. Uh, voter suppression is a traditional practice that is an, a, an assault on civil rights and a threat to our democracy. Voter suppression is a strategy used to influence the outcome of an election by discouraging or preventing specific groups of people from voting. In a healthy democracy, a political party will examine why they lost an election and adjust their platform to better serve the will of people. However, those that oppose would rather stop voters for exercising their right to vote. The League of Women Voters believe voting is a fundamental right and all eligible voters should have the equal opportunity to exercise that right. The League challenges all efforts and tactics that threaten our democracy and limit the ability of the voters to exercise their right to vote. Today's topic is an important one for all. As we move towards the end of Black History Month, and as we began to observe Women's History Month, we must remember that Black women voters played a huge role to not only help deliver familiar battleground states to the Democrat, but they also shook Georgia to its core. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this event and another opportunity to hear and learn from Dr. Allen's message. There is a link that will be made available in the chat that if you wanted to contact or your interest in the League of Women Voters, you can do so at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Once again, I'm Janine Went from HECMA, and I am pleased to be the one to actually introduce to you our guest speaker today, Professor Danielle Allen. Uh, she is a James Bryant Conant University professor at Harvard University. She's a political philosopher and public policy expert who focuses on democracy innovation, public health, and health equity justice reform, education, and political economy. She also directs the Safra Center's Democratic Knowledge Project, a K through 16 civic education provider. Her books include Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality, Cuz, An American Tragedy, and Talking to Strangers, Anxieties of Citizenship Since Brown versus Board of Education. She has chaired numerous commission processes and is a lead author on influential policy roadmaps, including Pursuing Excellence on Foundation of Inclusion, Roadmap to Pandemic Resilience, Pandemic Resilience, Getting It Done, Our Common Purpose, Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century, and the forthcoming Educating for American Democracy, excellence in history and civics for all learners K through 12. She was for many years a contributing columnist for Washington Post and writes for The Atlantic. Without further ado, Professor Danielle Allen. Thank you so much, Janine, I appreciate it. And thank you, Brenda, as well, for the call to conscience that you started us with. I'm grateful to have the chance to talk with all of you today and to engage with you in conversation about voting, the power of the vote, the power of the Black vote, but the power of the vote for all of us. It's fundamental value to human beings. I do think that one of the biggest political questions in our country right now is the question of whether we can reaffirm our commitment to universal suffrage. I actually do believe that that ethical commitment is currently in question that some people have fallen away from it. So in our conversation today, what I wanted to do was go back to the roots to think with you a little bit about why it is that the ballot is so important and voting rights so important to talk a little bit about the place of African-Americans in voting in Massachusetts and 
what work needs to be done there to fully empower and activate our Commonwealth, including African Americans. Um, and then return to the question of voter suppression that Brenda started with and the real challenges that we face as we try to secure the franchise for everybody. Um, I do have slides. You graciously invited me to a lunch and learn, and I'm going to go ahead and share some slides as a part of doing that. Um, so bear with me here. Let's see. And um, let me just. All right, I would like to start with a son of Massachusetts, W.E.B. Du Bois. In Souls of Black Folk, he famously said, the power of the ballot we need in sheer self-defense, else what shall save us from a second slavery. This is a profound statement. Oftentimes when we think about justice in human life, we start from questions of material goods, economic justice, uh, whether we have access to opportunity, labor market, schools, all of those things are critical. But Du Bois was making a fundamental point that all justice flows from the ability of people to control the direction of their own lives and the lives of their community. In other words, self-government through democracy is a founding stone for justice of all kinds. He elaborated and uh, oops, uh, in you know, this, this same passage from uh, Souls of Black Folk to talk about the way in which different parts of justice are connected to each other. And I just wanna share this passage with you because I think it's incredibly beautiful. To be really true, all these ideals must be melted and welded into one. The training of the schools we need today more than ever, the training of deft hands, quick eyes and ears, and above all the broader, deeper, higher culture of gifted minds and pure hearts. The power of the ballot we need in sheer self-defense, else what shall save us from a second slavery. Freedom too, the long sought we still seek, the freedom of life and limb, the freedom to work and think, the freedom to love and aspire. Work, culture, liberty, all these we need, not singly, but together, not successively, but together, each growing and aiding each and all striving toward that vaster ideal that swims before the Negro people, the ideal of human brotherhood gained through the unifying ideal of race, the ideal of fostering and developing the traits and talents of the Negro, not in opposition to or contempt for other races, but rather in large conformity to the greater ideals of the American Republic. So it's that triad of work, culture, liberty that I want you to focus on. The work being that access to education, to opportunity, and the ability to do things with one's hands and mind that create and contribute productively to the community. Culture, the work of developing moral ideals, of sharing art and literature and articulating a sense of identity and history for our community and liberty, that opportunity to contribute to the direction a community shapes for itself. All those three things have to work together. And Du Bois rightly recognized that the vote, the power of the ballot holds those things together. It drives politics where people can lift their voices and achieve economic opportunity. It opens up the public sphere to all voices so that we can shape our culture together and it secures participation in collective decision-making. So the ballot underpins a picture of human flourishing grounded in a concept of empowerment. And as we were hearing just at the start, we are at a point where we are seeing challenges to access to the vote. The pandemic resulted in a flood of new policies to make voting easier. The conditions were of course emergency conditions. We had to respond to the fact that infection was a problem. It's a problem in voting booths. And so we had early voting and vote centers and mail-in voting. And now we find ourselves in the wake of the election with lots of states around the country uh, trying to roll back mail-in voting as well as reduce some of the other ease of access provisions that were introduced. So this just takes you to the Brennan Center for Justice, which is doing a roundup of voting laws and has made the point that in 2021, Black History Month, we've seen um, an amazing um, effort across state legislatures to roll back um, the power of the vote. I'm gonna come back to this issue at the end of my presentation. Uh, but before we go there, what I want to do is talk a little bit more about the experiences of African Americans in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. My attention first came to the question of voter participation for African Americans in Massachusetts in 2008, 
when I was working as a regional field organizer in um, the Obama for America and America campaign during the primary. And I am a political scientist. I've done lots of work on politics, but I had not spent a lot of time poring over voting data. And I was really taken aback when I dug into voting data across the country by two facts in particular. One was by the fact that Asian Americans are the group within our society with the lowest rates of participation. And in that regard, the least full um, enfranchisement as of yet. And we have real work to do to elevate and engage our Asian American communities in participation. But with regard to African Americans, the, the data point that jumped out at me was that when you divide the country into regions, it was in the Northeast that African Americans were actually turning out to vote at the lowest levels. And this was deeply surprising to me because as a student of history, I am attuned to the fact that, for example, Massachusetts was the first state in the country to abolish enslavement. And Massachusetts has had free communities of African Americans from the time of the founding forward. So to recognize that the part of the country that actually has had the longest tradition of freedom for African Americans was also the part of the country with the lowest turnout for African Americans was really quite painful. So the good news is that we have seen progress um, over time in recent years. And I'm just gonna share the work of others here so that you can get a picture of the progress. Uh, but there is still definitely work to do. So this is an organization called uh, Massachusetts Voter Table which has been working on registering and turning out African-American voters. But the overall picture is still one in which African-American voters vote at rates lower than their percentage of the population. So in 2016, voters of color more broadly, but also African-Americans were a 12% of all ballots cast in the general election here in Massachusetts, whereas people of color account for 17.8% of the eligible voter population. So there's first of all a drop off to registration, only 15% of registered voters are people of color, um, and then a further drop off from registration to ballots cast. All right, so that is where we were as of 2016. That does actually reflect um, forward progress. Um, so to give you a sense um, of over time, turnout by race 2010 to 2016, um, and you will see that here in uh, Massachusetts, um, the group that has had the lowest levels of participation are, are Hispanic and Latinx um, residents of the Commonwealth. Um, Asian Americans also um, have been lower um, than African Americans, but you can see um, that there has been an upward trend. So I said there was good news. There's been an upward trend um, from 2010 to 2016, and the election of Barack Obama did make a real difference for engagement of communities. But what is important about the period of years that President Obama was in office was that that engagement wasn't sustained consistently across midterms as well as presidential elections. So in each midterm point, the numbers come down again and then uh, come back up again a bit in, 20, in the presidential election years. But an important gain or important goal for empowering all people is to really engage people um, in those midterm years as well as the presidential years. We should be aspiring to a sort of steady increase um, of this level of participation um, from year to year, including in midterm years, which requires real focus and concentration um, of effort. So just to give you um, a little bit more detail, um, now specifically, um, you'll see these are the numbers I was referring to previously. So here are the number of uh, specific voters that we're talking about when we recognize that voters of color are 70.8% of the eligible voters in Massachusetts, just under a million people. Of those million, about 680,000 are registered. And then of those um, in 2016, about 430,000 voted. Okay. So lots of people out there for us to connect with and engage um, in, in our Commonwealth. Now, here's some really good work from UMass Boston um, that is focused on thinking about the Latino vote in Massachusetts. Um, so here you have um, citizen uh, voting patterns um, over time from 2006 to 2018. And again, you can see good news. Um, we are achieving increases in participation, uh, but there's still a, a gap, a participation gap to close. And again, um, another picture of that same set of facts. Okay. Now, 
as we think about this, then there is a lot of work to be done for civic engagement to draw people into participation. And here I want to focus our minds on areas of possibility and potential. This is a chart from good work by colleagues at Tufts University, um, CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. They really focus on the question of youth engagement, and I'm sure you know their work. And this is the result of 2020 uh, voter registration efforts, where, uh, as you know, across the country, people were trying very hard to register youth voters despite the pandemic conditions. And you can see at the far end of that, the great success in Minnesota, Georgia, and Idaho. Those states really stand out at the moment. Georgia, we know about because of the hard work of Stacey Abrams and the new Georgia project and the Fair Fight project. They have been using micro targeting and, and real close analysis of data to find voters and turn them out. And their work has been broad. So certainly there's been a lot of press coverage on how Stacey Abrams has turned out African-American voters, but she's pursued a broader project of civic engagement and has really been connecting to rural communities and youth communities as well. And that's reflected there in that strength um, in Georgia. Massachusetts, again, it's good news. We increased voter registration for young people for October 2020 compared to November 2016. But I think this chart also indicates that we have real work to do, that we have a job ahead of us to recover that spirit of the son of Massachusetts Du Bois and rebuild the understanding that the ballot is foundational for empowerment generally. That brings with it the goal of rebuilding the recognition that empowerment is the foundation for human flourishing. So there are many civic engagement projects around the Commonwealth. At Harvard, we've been running a voter engagement project trying to achieve complete voting, universal voting, 100% of voter participation for everybody on campus, the Harvard Votes Project, we called it. And I know networks of higher education uh, organizations and colleges and universities have been working on this um, all over the country. But I do think that this, um, this comparison here indicates that in Massachusetts, we have work to do. We have potential, we have youth populations that are highly engaged of issues like climate and justice and the like, um, but we have potential to do, uh, we have potential to tap into um, and doing the work of fully engaging all our populations. But now I wanna to return to the hard issue of voter suppression and the hard question of where we are as a country with regard to universal suffrage. Over the last few years, I had the great good fortune of helping to lead a commission at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We put out a report in June called Our Common Purpose that has a set of recommendations for how we could collectively strengthen our democracy. And here I'm just giving you a subset of them that are focusing on empowering voters. And the focus here is two parts. One is about ease of voting, making sure it's straightforward through things like same day and universal voting registration. There's also a recommendation to move um, our federal election day to a national holiday, perhaps Veterans Day. But there's an even more significant recommendation here, and that is uh, the first one. Um, so item number two point, or sorry, rather 2.5, um, so it's not the first one. Um, the recommendation for universal voting. What is universal voting exactly? This is a policy that is in place in Australia. It's been in place for more than 100 years, and it's in place in other countries around the world too, which treats voting like jury service. So just as we have jury duty, the idea is that there's voter duty. It's a responsibility to turn out. And as a consequence, it's mandatory. Voting is mandatory. And there's a minimal fine for those who don't participate. To say that voting is mandatory does not mean that everybody has to fill in the blanks on a ballot. You can submit a blank ballot and that counts as participation. But it does, I recognize, sound in the first instance as if it goes against the grain to suggest that in the US we should think about making voting mandatory, treat it like jury duty. You know, we, we do recognize that jury duty is mandatory and that we have an obligation to fulfill with it. But really, can we extend that idea, that ethical framework to voting? I think it's time for us to address this question, to face it squarely, and in fact, to consider this. And here's where the issue links up with voter suppression. 
we are in a situation in the country where, as I said to start, I think we really are slipping away from a clear commitment to universal suffrage. This came home to me most profoundly in the debates this past summer over COVID policy in Congress between the two parties. There's a story about those debates, which is fundamentally about voting and voter access, which hasn't really made its way fully into public view. So you may remember that in May, the House proposed an act called the HEROES Act that had the job of providing all the investment in testing and contact tracing and other aspects of COVID suppression and response that we badly needed. The Senate did not move on this act over the course of the whole summer. They sort of stalled and stalled and stalled. The reason for the stalling was not disagreement about COVID policy. The reason for the stalling was because the HEROES Act, in addition to having all kinds of policies that were about response to the disease, also had in it a lot of policies that were about securing election integrity um, in the context of the pandemic. So during the summer, states were moving to bring in mail-in voting, as we did here in Massachusetts. States were setting up vote centers, they were setting up early voting. And the HEROES Act included funding for secretaries of state, state's office, around the country to make sure that they could execute on those policies effectively and safely. It included funding for the post office, for example. And it was because the package, the HEROES Act, included these election-related provisions that the Republicans were not interested in moving it forward at all. So they sat and they sat and they sat on it. And you'll remember the fight over the post office in September. That was the sort of last flare-up of the effort of the Democrats to get this whole package through. And it was only at the end of September when the election provisions were moot because it was too late to actually implement any of them, that's the point at which then the negotiations around COVID policy went forward again. So we actually, over the course of the summer, watched while response to COVID was held hostage to a fight over how we handle voting rights. And the thing that became very clear to me in that moment was that I could no longer take it for granted that my whole country affirmed the value of universal suffrage. Because at the end of the day, we were in a pandemic. It was necessary to make it possible for people to vote without exposing them to infection. There was an emergency reason for making access to the vote as easy as possible and as flexible as possible for everybody. From my point of view, this is very straightforward, not a hard question or decision. It was just a technical question of how to make good on the commitment to universal suffrage. But as we've seen in the Republican Party, there is an element in the Republican Party that has begun to take the view that um, there is a need to reduce the, the numbers of people who are voting. There is a concern that the full activation of the electorate would tip things in the direction or to the advantage of a particular party. As it happens, mail-in voting did not actually tip things in the direction of one party or the other now that all the results are and we can look at it closely, in fact. Um, there was a huge surge of participation across the board. Mail-in voting certainly helped that surge of participation and other features also uh, affected participation. Um, but across the country as a whole, mail-in voting did not advantage one party or the other. Um, but even with that sort of political question in the mix, the point is we have, to put, we have to put that aside because there's a fundamental principle here about universal suffrage. So the point I'm trying to make is that because the level of activation of the electorate appears to the parties to have political consequences for the parties, we've gotten to a point where one of our parties, the Republican Party, is working consistently to reduce levels of participation. Again, the understanding appears to be that's in the benefit of the party as an organization uh, to do that. So they are working themselves into a place where they're not any longer able to communicate a commitment to universal suffrage. My view is that we need to rebuild across our whole society a commitment to universal suffrage, and that the easiest way of doing that actually would be to leapfrog over all the questions about do we have mail-in voting or do we have vote centers and the like by simply saying we're going to have universal voting. We're going to establish that in federal elections, everybody has to vote. It's mandatory. And then we just have a technical question, as we do with jury duty, about how we actually get ballots into people's hands safely and in ways that ensure the integrity of the election. So in the recommendations that our commissions put out, some of them are about ease of access. Again, it is about the 
uh, same day registration, universal voting registration. But the really important recommendation here is the recommendation for universal voting. And again, I wanna underscore that its value is in clarifying once and for all that as a society, we are committed to universal suffrage. We should not have to fight over whether or not everyone should have the right to vote and access to the vote. That should be straightforward and a concluded line of argument. So for that reason, I encourage you to consider universal voting um, as a possible policy pathway. Again, I recognize that that is a shift um, of orientation for our culture, uh, where we in so many ways resist or think that mandates are not appropriate. But remember, we accept the notion of a duty, a required duty for our jury service. And I believe that our voter service should be on the same footing um, as our jury duty. So I hope then what I've done is given you a picture of a few things together. I wanted to just take us back to the words of Du Bois to reground us in how fundamental the ballot is to human well being. It undergirds our ability to be contributors in work, to be contributors in culture, and to participate in practices of liberty. Du Bois said that his goal was to be a co creator in the kingdom of culture. And I think that's a beautiful articulation of what empowerment gives to human beings. It gives us the chance to be setters of direction with our community to shape together the world that we live in. Having taken you back to that grounding in a core moral idea, matter of principle, I wanted to raise for you the sort of interesting historical um, anomaly that Massachusetts is a commonwealth that led initially on freedom for African-Americans yet has been lagging um, in recent years in terms of the participation of African-Americans and other people of color um, in our democracy. My hope was that I might then call all of us together back to a moral project of full inclusion of ensuring that our high turnout in this commonwealth pulls everybody in. We can be proud of our 75% turnout in the last presidential election and we want to see that level of turnout across all of our communities. But even as we celebrate our generally high turnout and work to achieve full inclusion for turnout for all voters in Massachusetts, I wanted to suggest that there's actually a further line of work that we need to do. And this is the project of restoring clearly and without question a commitment to universal suffrage in this country. My suggestion then, my practical suggestion was that the bright line way of calling the question on universal suffrage is to put an argument for universal voting as our core policy on the table. But whatever you think of that specific policy, what I hope above all is simply that you will take with you into the world a commitment to universal suffrage for everybody, literally universal, and articulate that commitment when you find yourself in conversations with people about the state of our electoral system. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation and questions. Thank you very much um, for your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. That was really educational and informative. I'm sure that there are lots of questions out there. I haven't seen any post in the chat. Oh, here we go. Um, Allison Staple, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Actually, Janine, uh, we would have to allow everybody to unmute if you wanted to do that. So if you wouldn't mind uh, reading the question. Gotcha, sure. Thank so you. Allison Staple post, posed a question about universal voting in reference to homeless people. Actually, that was a question that I had too, are people in shelters, how do they have access? That's a great question. And I mean, for, that is exactly the right question. So let me explain why that's exactly the right question. It's the right question because you, it's now the question of how do we make sure people get to participate in the vote, right? And that is the question we should be asking for every single part of our population. The good news is we do have the capacity to answer that question and we can look actually at how quickly our Commonwealth moved to help homeless people with regard to COVID. So we did a good job actually um, in this epidemic of making sure that we got resources of testing um, and medical support to homeless populations in the Commonwealth. Um, now that capacity means we can do the same thing for voting and for the ballot. 
I think all across the country and also here in Massachusetts, we did see that our Secretary of State's office had a real capacity to be flexible um, in during this pandemic in terms of making voting possible and succeeding. And I'm sure that with that same creativity and flexibility addressed to the question of homeless populations, that is something that we can solve. So I can't tell you right now precisely what that solution looks like, but we have the networks of social service organizations and organizations that work with homeless populations. And it's a matter of activating them um, in support of getting ballots into people's hands. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I have another question that came in regarding the US Postal Service and the fact that um, there were some issues with vote, voting ballots getting into uh, the hands of the, the counters and how your team may have thought this through for preventing anything like that happening in the future. So I do think there's a lot of, of work to be done here. So on the commission, um, when we did our work, um, we had lots of recommendations and in all honesty, mail-in voting was the last thing we added. And we added it specifically um, as a matter of response to the pandemic. Um, and because there is a lot of debate um, across the country in the context where people are experts about elections in, about execution for mail-in voting. So the evidence is that mail-in voting is sound. It is carried out effectively in numerous states as a matter of ordinary practice, not even in pandemic times. There is no um, evidence for an association between mail-in voting and fraud. So we know how to do it. The question was always, um, could we get all of the states um, at the same time up to the same level of functionality with mail-in voting as in the states that are already successful? And there, the harder problem actually, I think, than post offices getting um, the ballots to where they need to be on time um, is about uh, the voter rolls and making sure that every state um, has modern data systems for managing voter rolls. So there is real variation across the states on that front that requires attention. But again, we have states that have succeeded at that. We have the capacity to identify the best practices and disseminate them. And again, this for me is a place where once we accept universal suffrage and reinforce it by a commitment to a universal voting policy, then this becomes a purely technical question of how do we make sure across all of our states the capacity to execute um, on this is, is built up. Thank you. Um, Bryant Skoulos had asked a question, why hasn't the Democratic Party done more to expand the vote in recent years? While we clearly have one party that is attempting to systematically undermine suffrage, the Democratic Party has controlled both the Congress and the presidency for two periods in recent time, the first two years of the Obama administration and now with Joe Biden. Yet very little has been done to protect and expand access to voting. There are two great bills in the House and Senate currently, but their prospects seem quite low, even with Democratic control. So that's a great question. Um, I think in 08, there are two issues. I think at that point in time, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act was still in place at the beginning of the Obama administration. So that hadn't changed as of yet. Um, and in addition, um, you know, the Obama administration came in with a massive focus on health care, so directed energies there. The picture of voter suppression activity that we now ha have very clearly and plainly in front of us had not yet fully come into view by 2008. By 08. So in 08, we, it was clear that we had problems of differential participation, differential turnout, differential engagement, um, but not yet clarity that we were facing, um, going to be facing soon sort of real waves of problems with active voter suppression. Um, currently, I mean, as you point out, the question points out, HR1 um, in the House does have voter protections and voter access provisions. Um, it would bring in, um, you know, the sort of the achieving the goals for registration, for example, um, and support mail-in voting, vote centers, these kinds of things. Um, you're quite right that it's likely to pass the House and not pass the Senate. Um, so I think the hard question is how to identify 
parts of it that could be moved forward actually now that would secure bipartisan um, support. So for the commission that we did, um, that was a bipartisan commission, people from across the ideological spectrum participated. And so the recommendations from universal voting to uh, automatic registration, universal registration and things like that, we did actually achieve um, bipartisan consensus for. So it's a sm somewhat smaller footprint of policy than what's in HR1, but from our point of view, it was an impactful starting point. So in that regard, I would encourage um, you know, the, the consideration of once we see what happens with HR1, doing the work of pulling out pieces of that to move it forward. All that said, it's also the, the case that states can do an awful lot of work. So I do think it's really important. I'm, I'm glad Brenda's here from the League of Women Voters. The League did a lot to get the pandemic voting provisions in, and now Massachusetts is debating whether those will be extended. So states themselves can take on the work and responsibility of really um, providing that protection for the vote. And again, I think you know it's worth remembering that in November, after the election was done, and then there was this tremendous assault on its integrity um, coming from the White House, it was states that held the line, right? Both parties, Republicans as well as Democrats, state secretary of state stood up and they did their job and they protected the vote. So that really does show you, I think, the capacity that states have um, to build the healthy foundation for a robust um, you know, structure of universal suffrage. Thank you. Thomas Ford had a question. What do you consider some of the best ways for someone who wants to become a larger part of voter suppression advocacy? So I think, um, you know, there are a number of possibilities. I, the, both of the organizations that I pointed to um, in the slideshow, the Massachusetts Voter Table and the UMass um, Gaston Center are doing important work on voter engagement. Um, the League of Women Voters, as you've just heard, is doing important work, and so you can reach out and figure out how to support them. Um, the, the organizations that were started in Georgia, like Fair Fight, now also have chapters in other parts of the country, and so that would be a thing to look into as well, whether or not um, there's a way to build out that work um, from Massachusetts. Some people in Massachusetts are doing work of supporting people in other states, um, and so I think that's another important thing to get connected to. Thank you. Mark Wagner posed a question. Um, do you identify any central factors that would encourage women and black indigenous and people of color to run for elected office? Oh, it's interesting. Oh, I thought the first question was gonna, I thought it was gonna be about voter participation first. So let me, let me address both actually, um, how to encourage people into participation and then also the question of how to encourage people into running for office. Um, so on the participation front, generally, um, research over and over again shows a very simple idea, which is that people need to be invited to participate. Um, and an invitation goes a long way. And so, again, I think this really goes, this speaks to the success of the work done in Georgia, that they used data to connect with people who weren't voting, um, but to find them in a really micro-targeted way so that they could make invitations that were really specific to those individuals and make sure that people are getting connected with others um, who come from their own communities. So there's a lot of research in California on this point as well. And again, that sometimes people are just not participating because literally no one has ever said to them, I think you should participate. Um, so building out networks of people who make that invitation into uh, participation is really, really critical and important. Uh, honestly, I think the same thing is true about elected office that um, there, it can look like a very big leap to take. And as I have talked to people and learned from other people's experiences, what I hear is that, you know, people, um, women, people of color, um, they, it very often helps them to have others say to them, gosh, I think you'd be really good at this. You should give it a try. Um, there's a sort of perception that this is a kind of activity that's for others. Um, and again, a kind of chorus of invitation, I think makes a very big difference. Um, that said, it is also the case that uh, there are all kinds of practical hurdles and challenges, things, for example, connected to the place of fundraising and campaigns and the like um, that require um, solutions and support. So I think, you know, networks of mutual aid um, can go a long way for helping non-traditional candidates um, come into the, into the mix. Um, the last thing I'll say on that is I'm an advocate of ranked choice voting, as I'm sure many of you know. 
Um, and I do think ranked choice voting is an approach to elections that does um, open up possibility for candidates from non-traditional backgrounds. We actually co-hosted with the Edward M. Kennedy Center a debate on ranked choice voting this past September. Oh, uh, actually, fantastic. Constitution Day. That's great. So, yeah, so we've tried to educate our population about that potential opportunity may come back in the future. Yes, yes no, exactly. I think that's one of the things that's hard with all of the work on voting is it does take education at the level of whether it's basic participation or whether it's participating in ranked choice voting or anything like that. Um, there's just a set of stuff that you do need to know and the rules can seem arcane or can they, they can be hard to find your way into. This is a place where I think the League of Women Voters has really excelled and, and Brenda, you may wanna to speak to this some, but I mean, I think, you know, the League from, you know, it's from its earliest days in the beginning of the 20th century has taken on that project of voter education and we, we cannot under, uh, it's, it's impossible to overstate its importance um, because you know, driving is a, is a good example. We don't expect people just to kind of go off and hop in a car and, and take off and leave it at that. We do expect them to go through a process of driver education. And there's a whole heck of a lot of rules of the road that you have to acquire and comfort that you have to build up in order to get behind the wheel. And voting is no different in that regard from driving. And as it happens, it's also empowering in the same way that driving is empowering, gives you mobility and freedom. So I do think we have to bring that um, kind of orientation to just like perpetual education, perpetual support for people's development as voters um, into the picture. Um, but Brenda, do you wanna share something yeah, I, I agree with you uh, solely on that and the impact of education. It helped us, especially during COVID uh, in this past election, what we could learn is to learn and unlearn. And so we can do our best practices with informed information. We can make informed choices. And this is so powerful, uh, your message today, because that's what we are in the League of Women Voters in Worcester. We have forums to educate and to learn together. How can we better go to the communities that are underrepresented and do a better job of educate, educate, educate. So thank you so much for that. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see a question in the chat too about uh, making progress on universal voting. And I'm just gonna stick um, something in the chat to give you a reference. Um, Cause there is a coalition of people starting to build up to tackle this um, work. And I wanna just admit up front, I was skeptical, okay? When the commission started our work on this, I was definitely originally uh, one of the naysayers um, on the idea, on the idea that would go too much against the grain of our kind of libertarian culture. And I came round on universal voting for a few reasons. Um, one is the analogy to jury duty and recognition that's really no different than jury duty. And we have no problem accepting the idea that there's a universal expectation for service. If you're called for jury duty, there may be exemptions, reasons to get out and so forth. But at the end of the day, there's an expectation that we fulfill that. And we certainly don't shirk that duty. Um, and then the second point was just the recognition that um, the question of whether we are committed to universal suffrage in this country really is open. It's, I can't tell you right now that I believe that the entirety of my fellow citizenry is committed to universal suffrage. And in the face of that recognition, I see only one path. That is, we need a concrete goal that also counts as a reaffirmation of a commitment to universal suffrage. So this seems to me the best possible concrete goal to count as a commitment to universal suffrage. Um, and so I have just definitely put my whole heart and mind behind it. So I wanna agree that I think it's a, we're at the bottom of a steep mountain to climb on this idea, but it also strikes me that, you know, that was true at other points in our history too. We've had a whole lot of steep mountains to climb. So, you know, why not this one, especially since um, you know, we thought we achieved the principle of universal suffrage early in the 20th century was we introduced women's right to vote and then finally secure the right to vote for Native Americans. Um, but again, but then we weren't quite done because we had to deal with all of the uh, tactics and so forth in the South, poll taxes and literacy taxes in the middle of the 20th century and the like. 
Um, and here we are again, finding ourselves not quite done. So why don't we just put it to bed once and for all by saying, you know, we meant it when we said we were taking universal suffrage. We really meant it. So we're going to make it a universal voting duty and just be done with it. Let's turn it into a technical question of execution from here on out. There's a question from Maria Baca. Why don't we think to change the electoral voting system to the popular voting system as a first step to prepare and educate the population for the universal vote? Um, Maria doesn't believe that the country's ready to accept the idea of mandatory voting. So I'm gonna push back on that actually. I, I hear you and I hear the, the idea of what might be the sequence of possibility um, I think from our commission experience, we found a different sequence of possibility. So um, we absolutely, we did get, in fact, this cross ideological or bipartisan consensus around universal voting, mandatory voting. Um, however, the question of the electoral college was an absolute breaking of any possibility for uh, consensus or um, uh, agreement. Um, and I think there's actually a good reason for this. So I'm a supporter of the electoral college. I think we have to reform by increasing the size of the house. Um, this is a long story. I could, if you want me to say more, you'll you tell me. But but basically, um, you know, Congress was capped in the 1920s by law. It shouldn't have been. It was always supposed to grow with the size of the population. It's the capping of Congress that has given us an electoral college that overweights the voters in less populous parts of the country. And if we increase the size of the Congress, it changes the number of electors in the Electoral College and it reweights the Electoral College so that it can do what it's supposed to do, which is to give smaller states a very small additional protection, um, but not as much additional protection as they're currently getting. All right, so that from my point of view, that's the right solution to the Electoral College. Um, I think we do need an ongoing state-based structure for our elections. I don't think a national popular vote structure will work because of the ways in which small states would get swamped by that. Um, so I, I stick with that kind of principle of we need a blend of state-based and population-based mechanisms for our elections. Um, so that said, um, in that regard, paradoxically, um, at least in our commission experience, there was actually much more room and movement around the universal voting idea than there was around the national popular vote idea. But Janine, I just wanted to uh, be mindful of Dr. Allen's time. We have time for one more question before we end. Yeah. Do you want to ask the question or do you want me to if, ask it, the question? Actually, I was looking at the questions. I think that um, perhaps Danielle's already answered the questions that are in the chat. Oh, there's another one coming in. Um, Allison Staple. Do you think this would lead to issues of other ways to suppress voting, like denying or prolonging citizenship status? I, I do think that the fights that we already are having about immigration would also, um, yes, become a part of this. So that said, I don't think that um, that, I mean, I think we're already having that fight in all honesty about immigration. Um, it really is important to recognize that the pathway to citizenship fight is also a fight about um, the electoral uh, roles and context. There are 11 million, as you know, undocumented people in the US and that population of 11 million is very much a working class population. So when we think about why our policies um, seem, well, they do, and political scientists have documented this, are the policies that flow out of Congress align with the interests of the country's wealth elite. This is true over and over. It's actually true across parties and across administrations. And a reason for this is because 11 million people who are in the working class don't have the right to vote, right? So there is another, it, it, is, it is already a part of what is being fought over in the immigration context. And I think that yes, you're right, but that would continue um, in our politics for sure. Yes. We are so grateful to you, yes. Professor Allen, for joining us today. You. Um, your insight and experience that you shared with us is amazing. And we really hope that you'll consider coming back again, maybe in six months or a year to give us some more information as things progress.
Thank you. Well, I so appreciate your engagement with this important topic. I just want to close by saying again, I mean, I, I truly do believe, like Du Bois, that the vote is fundamental for human well-being for all people. And so I appreciate your openness to a conversation with me on that subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we close, I just want to thank also Worcester State, the conference services for hosting us today. I want to thank all of our participants. And I want to thank Brenda Safford as the president of League of Women Voters for her insights and for co-sponsoring this session for us today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful one. <laughs> Enjoy. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Take care.